Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. Good afternoon and welcome to Concord Matters here on the Worldwide Messenger of Good News, KFUO. I am your host for this program. I'm Pastor Charles Henriksen, the pastor of St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Bonterre, Missouri. If you'd like to find out more about St. Matthew and Bonterre, our website is stmatthewbt.org. And um, we invite your participation in our program today. Today we're going to be looking in the Lutheran Confessions at an article about the Mass. We'll find out what the Mass is and uh, where Lutherans uh, perhaps differ from the Roman Catholics on a few things. And so we ask uh, if you want to comment or raise a question, you're welcome to do so. Our toll-free number across North America is 800-730-2727. Again, 800-730-2727. Locally here in St. Louis, the phone number is 314-821-0850. Again, 314-821-0850. You can also email us your comments or questions. The email address, kfuo at kfuo.org. Um, in the studio today, uh, over to my right, is a regular guest on this program, and that is Pastor Warren Worth. Welcome, Warren. Good to be with you again. And you are the pastor where? At Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Arnold, Missouri. Just, uh, you're, I think you're the northernmost church in Jefferson County, within uh, a stone's throw of, sometimes closer, uh, of the uh, Merrimack River. So in our circuit, yes, yeah, so we're the northernmost congregation in our circuit. Um, 2211 Tenbrook Road, for those who are in our area, we're not far from Fox High School, so that's an easy way. And you're near the Chick-fil-A and a lot of things, so, so that's easy to get to from Jefferson County or Southern uh, St. Louis County. Do you have a Thanksgiving service this year? We do, as a matter of fact. Our worship service on Thanksgiving Day is at 10 a.m. We'll be using the Order of Matins. We in invite those in the listening area to join us as we give thanks to God for all his gifts, especially the gift of salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. And uh, we have a Thanksgiving Day. We were just talking before the program how many churches now only do th Thanksgiving Eve if they only have, if even if they do a Thanksgiving service. You and I, I guess, are the old dinosaurs who still do service on Thanksgiving Day itself, which is really the purpose of the day. So at, at St. Matthew uh, Bon Terre, our matin service that day, Thursday morning, will be at 9 a.m. So I guess you could go to 9 a.m. at uh, Bon Terre and drive up the road a little bit and get in a, at... Uh, at Good Shepherd in Arnold. Well, glad to have you here. And your website address? Our website is goodshepherdarnold.org. Very good. Now, uh, in the studio today, we were all ready to have another guest, another, another regular on this program, Pastor Randy Asbury of Hope Lutheran Church in St. Louis. But uh, I talked to Randy. In fact, I just talked to him again a couple minutes ago. His wife, Rachel, had to go to the hospital this morning, she was feeling a little lightheaded, uh, some maybe some heart concerns, although the EKG came out all right. So I just talked to Randy, um, and Rachel is over at uh, Mercy Hospital. So we want to uh, think about them and to pray for them. And I'll ask Pastor Worth if you would lead our listeners in a prayer for Rachel Asbury. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father. We thank you for every good and perfect gift. We thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of love, for our spouses and children. We thank you for health, and 
We also thank you for doctors and nurses, hospitals and medicine and the wonders you work through them. Into your mighty and merciful hands, we commend our sister, Rachel. We ask, O Lord, that you would guide the medical team as they care for her and that she may soon come home once again to her family and friends. Grant her health and healing according to your own good pleasure. But especially give her a strong and living faith in her strong and living Savior, Jesus, that in sickness and health she may trust in him and at last receive the crown of life through the merits and mediation of the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So uh, we're talking about today, we're talking about the Mass, uh, an article that is found in uh, the Augsburg Confession, and then uh, the defense of that in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. So this is Article 24 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. That's going to be our topic today. And uh, the title, The Mass. Uh, what do, I thought Lutherans don't do the Mass, Pastor Worth. What is, what is it, first of all, what is the Mass? And uh, what are some ways in which we could use the term rightly or we don't use the term? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, what in the Augsburg Confession, when Melanchthon was writing that, he was trying to point out that our Lutheran forefathers were um, good Catholic boys who were not adding anything new or taking anything away from the Christian Catholic faith. Catholic in the best sense. In the best sense of the word, yes. The, the, the Bible-believing Christians, okay? The ones who haven't, we're not inventing something new. We're just teaching what's always been there in God's Word, and uh, when the church is taught rightly, we are Catholic in that sense. Absolutely so. And they were being accused of abolishing the Mass, and so Article 24 of the of the Augsburg Confession itself is pointing out, no, 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 we do not abolish the Mass. We celebrate it every Lord's Day and on all other holy days, and uh, the Holy Supper is given to those who desire it. And but so been... to find the term, how is the term the Mass being used in there in that sense? Okay, very good. So the the term Mass, which you and I today would probably more commonly talk about, the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. Uh, these are other terms for the same thing. But the Mass, if you think about the divine service in which the Lord's Supper is celebrated, that's it. You see, we can use the term Mass in a in the very narrow sense of referring to the Lord's Supper itself or the divine service of word and sacrament. Precisely. Yeah. And, and we'll see that as we read through the Which includes the all today. the ceremonies and rites that go with it. Yes, absolutely so. And and uh, as our Lutheran forefathers pointed out, you know, they did not abolish the Mass. They celebrated it every Lord's Day and every Holy Day. And the Lord's Supper was given to those who had been previously examined and absolved. And so uh, they do it with great reverence and so forth. Even still in Latin at that time, they said one of the main differences was that they still they interspersed uh, the service of the sacrament with German hymns because they felt that the people who did not know and understand Latin well would uh, greatly benefit from German hymnody that would direct their hearts to Jesus. And so it was a matter of teaching people in their own language so that they would understand what was going on and so that they would receive the gospel, uh, both through the word and the gospel that is the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, that they would receive this with faith. And that's the, the whole emphasis here is always helping the people to have faith in Jesus and their faith should be directed to Jesus because that's where your comfort is. That's where the forgiveness of sins is found and not in our works. And that became part of the bone of contention because the Church of Rome was teaching that uh, you can have the Mass, even if the congregation isn't there. You can have private Masses where a priest is simply saying, for example, the words of institution, and it's not so that the body and blood of Jesus can be given to people who are there to receive his body and blood, to receive the forgiveness of sins, to be strengthened in their faith. It's like you're doing a work whereby others will benefit kind of long distance. They can benefit... Even as, if they're dead. Even if they're dead. Yes, a sacrifice for the sins of the living and the dead. And and there's all kinds of issues here that we need to bring up yes. and that, that do come, come up here and how to correct those abuses. The, the Lutherans wanted to correct those abuses that were against the gospel, against the teaching of Holy Scripture, at the same time retaining what is definitely scriptural and has been passed down uh, through the ages 
in the church Catholic in the best sense of that term. Yeah. All Christians who believe, teach, and confess what the Bible teaches on this subject. Very good. You have touched on some of the main points here that I want to bring our listeners up to speed in case they're coming at this fresh. Uh, and by way of review from the Augsburg Confession article and the apology up to this point. And you've, I think there's really three main points. One you mentioned. One that, one that I didn't mention yet, perhaps, is in terms of the term mass. Since, okay. that's, since that's one we don't tend to use very much uh, in our own circles anymore. It was still, obviously, in use by Melanchthon and Luther and the people at that time. And it comes from the ending of the service in Latin. And since you're the Latin scholar, you can say what it means. But it's basically about dismissing people yeah. at the end of the service. Yeah, like id est uh, missa or something. Missa est, yeah. yeah missa it, it est. Is missa est. It's, it's uh, over. <laughs> right, you're right. dismissed. Go, go, you are dismissed, right? Yeah, That's yeah. basically it. Uh, there are different theories about the term mass. Uh, one is from, from that, from the dismissal at the end, or another was, I seem to recall, uh, uh, sounding like a word for altar or sacrifice from he Hebrew. Um, so there are different theories about that. But the point is how the term is being used is to refer to uh, Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper itself, or a little more broadly, the divine service with all of its attendant rites and ceremonies that features and includes and highlights the Lord's Supper. Yes. All right. But now in your summary there, you've touched on the main points to bring our listeners up to speed. One you said about uh, that we are falsely accused of abolishing the Mass. I'll just read a quote here from the Augsburg Confession itself. Our churches are falsely accused of abolishing the Mass. The Mass is held among us and celebrated with the highest reverence. Uh, nearly all the usual ceremonies are also preserved. And they say ne nearly all because in the reform of the Mass, uh, and Luther reformed the Mass in 1523 and again in 1526, uh, the Formula Missae, um, and now this is in 1530. So they had excised the portions that were obscuring the gospel about what we'll talk about the sacrifice of the Mass, a misunderstanding of that. And then from uh, the Apology, the parallel uh, paragraph there about where we're falsely accused. That's in Apology, Article 24, Paragraph 1. Um, we do not abolish the Mass, but religiously keep and defend it. Masses are celebrated among us every Lord's Day, that's every Sunday, communion, and on other festivals, like... Um, Christmas. Yeah, the, which may not fall on a Sunday, Epiphany, Ascension, this sort of thing. Um, the sacrament is offered, etc., so uh, that was the first point you mentioned, that Lutherans keep the Mass. Now, we could talk, and this is not the topic of our study today, but how Lutheran churches got away from every Sunday communion and how thankfully in the last, oh, I'd say 20, 25 years, there's been a, a return to every Sunday communion. That's a good thing. Um, but the other two points you made, one was about private Masses and one was about just by virtue of doing the work apart from faith. Those were the two points you made. And so uh, in the preceding paragraphs in Apology 24, um, for example, in paragraph 6 and following, it says, we, we do not do private masses. Explain, you sort of touched on that. What is meant by, and these are still done in Roman Catholic churches to this day. I know this. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are private Masses? Right. And we want to clarify this for our listeners who may confuse this with private communion with the sense that if a Lutheran pastor comes to visit the sick and home, We're not talking about shut-in visits. Right. Yeah. That, that is not the private Mass. You know, that's basically an extension of the public right. celebration of the Lord's Supper in the church where the pastor then comes and brings the body and blood of Jesus to those who cannot make it to the service where the congregation is gathered together. So it's still part of that. It's an extension of that. Mm -hmm. But in the Roman Catholic Church, both in the time of the Reformation and to this day, a private Mass is with the idea that you can pay mm -hmm. the priest to say Mass, for example, for the a, a d departed loved one or something of this nature, and, and Mass is said. In other words, he's, he's saying the Mass, saying, go, going through the words of institution and so forth, consecrating the elements, but not necessarily with anybody being there. For a there. congregation. 
Yeah, there, there's no congregation there. And even if, let's say, for example, somebody might be there, the intention is not to do it for the distribution and benefit of the assembled people of God, the faithful, but rather it's doing something that is intended to earn God's favor yeah. by the act of the priest doing this, and perhaps by somebody meditating on it, or adoring it, or something like this. But the idea Even that- for those who have died which is tied to their doctrine of purgatory. Right. Their doctrine of purgatory is such that, you know, that, in other words, they're teaching that Christ, by his passion, by his suffering and death on the cross on Good Friday, paid for the original sins of people, but the daily sins that we still commit need to be atoned for and paid off by the continual sacrifice of Christ, a real though unbloody sacrifice of Christ in the Mass. And that's that's the Roman Catholic doctrine that this is all about. So by paying the priest to say Mass, when he says the words of institution, this is my body, Christ is re-sacrificed according to them, in a real though unbloody way, and he's being sacrificed for the sins of the living and the dead. And that includes venial and mortal sins, according to their teaching, which would mean that your dead grandfather, who's still in purgatory, you're still paying off his debt. You're still paying off his sins. And so by having a mass said for him, uh, you're sort of taking time off his detention. Hopefully he'll get out of uh, purgatory faster that way. That is the, the teaching. and this With was, no scriptural support. There is zero scriptural support for this, and this is something that gets addressed later on in more detail, but it's already being addressed here in the words we're going to read today. And And just the idea of a private mass is kind of self-contradictory because Christ instituted it to be done in congregations right. for God's people in the church. Exactly. So when Jesus celebrated it at the first, at the Last Supper with his own disciples, you know, keep on doing this in remembrance of me, yeah. for it's to be for done that way. For us Christians to eat and to drink. For us Christians to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of our sins. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I know of, and I've even seen examples of this, where somebody has died and so a friend will say, oh, I," and they send a card saying, I had a mass said for Aunt Tilly, uh, you know, they paid a little fee to the Catholic Church, and the priest said a private mass for Aunt Tilly's soul in purgatory. Now, the person who does that, uh, a Catholic layman, may be erring ingenuously. They may be well-intentioned, but it's tied to a wrong teaching. Exactly, and and it's quite lucrative. It certainly was in in, in, in those the, days. It in was. the days of the, of the Reformation, it was very lucrative, and the abuse was well known. And so that's why they keep touching upon this, doing this for filthy wealth. You know, people are doing this for filthy wealth, and what an abuse it is of this wonderful gift of God where Jesus gives us his body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and you've turned it into something totally different from what Jesus intended it to be. And this ties into the other point you made, is that the Roman Catholic uh, theologians were saying that the Mass had value, and the technical term in Latin, ex opera operato, which has nothing to do with Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> but what is this phrase, ex opera operato? It's just by the external work, by performing the external work without faith. So it's not about faith. It's about the, just going through the motions. If you do the external work, it's good enough. And that is, you know, does the, the, does the deed. Does the, the Latin means by the, by out of the work having been worked. Right. Uh, that, and you correctly paraphrase it. It means just simply having done the work Apart from faith, and this is the point Melanchthon makes over and over again, that the, the gifts of, uh, there are gifts given in Holy Communion, but they are to be received by faith right? in Christ the Mediator. Very good. So that brings us up to speed then, um, although I want to talk about this term, uh, sacrifice, uh, that was brought up, and uh, Melanchthon makes a distinction between sacrament and sacrifice. I know when I teach catechism, I always uh, do an illustration on the board here, maybe you do something similar, about the difference between sacrament and sacrifice. Okay, a sacrament is a work whereby God is imparting gifts to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's essentially what's going on. A sacrament is from God to us imparting a gift. A sacrifice would be that we are offering something to God and uh, in, in 
in honor of him or in obedience to him. And there's two kinds of... Well, hold on in that. Oh, okay, I'm getting moment. ahead of you there. So <laughs> the illustration I always put on the dry erase board, for sacrament, I draw the arrow down Correct. from God to us, and sacrifice, I draw an arrow up from us to God. And uh, the problem comes when you get those arrows turned around, and you make right. the uh, us to God arrow more important than the God to us arrow. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and and that's one of the things that Melanchthon wants to address here is the uh, uh, confusing of these. Yeah. And now you next thing you were saying was about two kinds of sacrifice. And after our break, we'll get, which is going to be about four minutes or something. We'll get more into that. But um, he talks about two kinds of sacrifice. What are they? The two kinds, one would be atoning sacrifice. That is a sacrifice that pays for sin, makes it makes satisfaction for sin, and uh, it, the way they word it here is to, uh, to reconcile God or to reconcile God's wrath. That's the way he talks about it. In other words, God is angry because of our sins, and a sacrifice is going to take away our sins and render God uh, gracious to us and f- for the forgiveness of our sins. That's one thing, an atoning sacrifice. The other they call a Eucharistic sacrifice. And the uh, Eucharistao in Greek means I give thanks. So it's a th- uh, response of thanksgiving and praise to God for by those who have already been reconciled, mm-hmm. those who are already redeemed, restored, and forgiven, and they're responding to God's grace and God's love and God's forgiveness in Christ Jesus by giving thanks and praise, and that involves uh, worship and prayer, uh, the Christian life, enduring persecution, uh, that they'll go on and talk yeah. about a number of the things that are part of that. And likewise, then in the the service of the Mass, the ceremonies of the Mass, they were distinguishing between uh, what is sacrament and what is sacrifice, and saying that for Rome to say that the priest saying, this is my body and consecrating the supper, that that is sacrifice is a misunderstanding that, that in other words, it's, it's sacri- not the priest. Now, now the, the pre-Vatican II Rome would say it's the priest making the sacrifice. Since Vatican II, it's the people making the sacrifice. But still, they're, they're, it's the wrong group or person making the atoning sacrifice. Right. And the atoning sacrifice, as our fathers point out, as Scripture points out, is a once and for all thing. Again and again, uh, we point to the epistle to the Hebrews, yes. where the writer to the Hebrews uh, compares the repeated sacrifices. In fact, perhaps you heard this this past Sunday, if you use a three-year I lecture. I preached on that. In fact, we're doing an adult Bible class right now on the book of Hebrews. So in, in the writer to the Hebrews says, you know, the sacrifices uh, of the temple and the, before that the tabernacle were made day after day, year after year, uh, generation after generation, because the sacrifice of bulls and goats could not, their blood could not really take away sin. But they pointed forward. They were a promise and a picture of the coming of the Lamb of God, Jesus, who is both the priest and the sacrifice in one, and who by one sacrifice has taken away our sins forever. And that's the, the heart and soul of all of this. Very good. Ian, can we take our break now? Because this is a good break point. Thank you. Uh, You're listening to Concord Matters here on KFUO. We'll come back after this break and actually get into some new material. You're listening to Concord Matters. This is Matt Harrison, president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Today I give thanks for you, for your joy-filled service to the Lord and to the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. You know, daily I am humbled by the many visible examples of people demonstrating Christ's love for their neighbor. Our witness and service reflect the love of God for this world. Because we have been loved, we love. God calls each of us to serve him in different places and ways. Through your commitment to sharing the gospel, you make known the love of Christ in your churches, communities, and the world. You are the body of Christ, Christ's presence in this world. Rejoice, pray, give thanks, all in Christ Jesus. In this season of gratitude, may you be abundantly blessed.
This week on Issues Etc., we'll have Pastor Brian Wolfmiller introduce us to the book of Joel. We'll continue our series on the U.S. Constitution, talking with Dr. Russell Dawn about the 16th Amendment, which empowered the federal government to tax our income. And we'll discuss the diversity delusion on college campuses with Heather McDonald. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. Three things make a believer. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Prayer, meditation, and growth. Which is why every weekday morning from 7 to 8 a.m. we bring you Oratio, an hour of solace, contemplation, scripture, sacred music, and faith. Oratio, the dawn breaks with prayer every morning on Worldwide KFUO. Sojourner Truth, born in slavery around 1797 in New York, became one of the most famous abolitionists of her time. As a child, she had several owners. After 17 years, she escaped with her daughter and was ultimately aided by a Quaker couple who bought her and then freed her. Sojourner spent the rest of her life speaking against slavery. A prolific preacher and speaker, she never learned to read, but that didn't stop her from learning. Over the years, she made sure people read to her, especially from the Bible. By the end of the Civil War, she not only met with President Lincoln, she had petitioned the government to make Western lands available to freed blacks and made countless speeches in support of African Americans and women. Sojourner Truth died November 26, 1883, a free woman. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible. We are back now on Concord Matters on Worldwide KFUO, the messenger of good news. I'm your host for this program, Pastor Charles Henriksen. In the studio with me is Pastor Warren Worth. We're in Article 24 of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, and we're talking about the Mass. And now we're going to uh, look at some new paragraphs here. We did a kind of an update and review uh, in the first half of the program. And by the way, we invite your comments, uh, 800-730-2727 or 314-821-0850 or email kfuo at kfuo.org. Reading now, paragraph 22. In fact, there has been only one atoning sacrifice in the world, namely Christ's death. As the epistle to the Hebrew teaches, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Uh, A little later of the will of Christ, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body. Now, uh, again, what is meant just briefly by an atoning sacrifice? What is this idea of atoning? Okay, so we have sinned against God and have incurred his wrath. And so an atoning sacrifice is a sacrifice that satisfies God's anger against our sin. His justice. His, his ju- ju- justice against our, our sin, exactly. Breaking the law. And, and therefore, uh, God is gracious and forgiving toward us on account of the sacrifice made in, in that way in order to uh, uh, take away his wrath and gr- render God to be gracious to us and give us the forgiveness of sins. Now, in the Old Testament... Yeah, talk about this bulls and goats because it says, that they can't take away sins, but I thought God had established for, as a law for Israel the sacrifice of bulls and goats. Absolutely, and so throughout the Old Testament, and certainly from Sinai onward, you see that that was a requirement. God established the priesthood of Aaron and gave instructions to Moses and Aaron regarding the tabernacle, and later then with, under Solomon, the, the temple. And uh, the sacrifices and priesthood were part of what God had ordained, but never as an end in themselves. Obviously, okay. they, they, these were things that were types. In other words... That's the term. Exactly. There were, there were actions and objects, things that were... Uh, looking forward to, pointing forward to something greater. And that greater thing is the coming of Jesus. So Jesus 
is the one who fulfills what the Old Testament priesthood could only prefigure. He's the one that the sacrifices of the Old Testament could only prefigure. So the blood of bulls and goats that were uh, and they had out. to be repeated over and over again, showing that they never really finished the job. Exactly. But they pictured the coming of Jesus. So the fact that, for example... The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the The animals world. had to be without spot and without blemish. So here comes Jesus, who is the only sinless one without spot and blemish, who offers up his perfect life as the one perfect sacrifice to take away all sins for all sinners forever. And that's the point. And so, Pastor Worth, I don't know about you, but I mean, I have never put a, a, a bull or a goat or a lamb on the altar and thrown a knife into it. Uh, we don't do that anymore. And I'm thinking of this uh, because Jesus has already fulfilled that. That's already served its purpose. Uh, I'm thinking of the verse in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, things of the Old Testament uh, Israel worship. And then verse 17, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So they literally foreshadowed uh, the coming of Christ. I, I use the illustration, like if I come into a room and there's a light source behind me, you see my shadow before me, before you see me, but once the real person walks in, in the room, you don't look at the shadow anymore. Precisely so. In fact, already the Old Testament made it clear that there was one coming who would be the sacrificial victim. And that's what Isaiah is going to be talking about. And you're going to read that in just a moment here, I'm sure, because the text points to that very thing. All right. Let's go on then to paragraph uh, 23. Isaiah interprets the law of Moses so that we may know Christ's death is truly a satisfaction for our sins or remedy, and that the ceremonies of the law, uh, like the, the tabernacle sacrifice and so on, are not. He says, quote, When his soul, meaning the suffering servant, when his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, and so on. Isaiah 53, verse 10. The word used here means a victim for transgression, Asham would be the Hebrew word. Uh, In the law, this illustrated that a certain victim was to come to make satisfaction for our sins and reconcile God. This was so that people might know that God wishes to be reconciled to us, not because of our own righteousness, but because of another, another's merits, Christ. Paul interprets the same word, Asham, as sin, quote, For sin he condemned sin, Romans 8, verse 3. That is, he punished sin for sin, that is, by a victim for sin. The meaning of the word is more easily understood from pagan customs. These were adopted from their misunderstanding of statements by the fathers. The Latins called a victim a piaculum, which was offered to reconcile God's anger and great calamities, where he seemed to be especially enraged. Sometimes they sacrificed human victims, perhaps because they had heard that a human victim would reconcile God for the entire human race. The Greeks sometimes called them cleansing, katharmata, and sometimes wiping away, parapsemeta. Isaiah and Paul, therefore, mean that Christ became a victim, that is, a remedy that by his merits, and not by our own, God might be reconciled. Now, He's Melanchthon, who's, who is a well-read scholar and knew about uh, history of religions and so forth. He's comparing what Isaiah and Paul are preaching about Christ as the victim that atones for our sins versus pagan religions, which have, they're always offering up sacrifices. You think of the Mayan sacrifices of the uh you know, young virgins or something. So there's a sense in pagan religion that the gods are unhappy if there's some disaster and we have to mollify them by a sacrifice of grain or blood or something. What's the distinction between the biblical idea of sacrifice, of Christ making the sacrifice, and sort of this twisted variant uh, in pagan religions? Okay, well, obviously, the true religion, as revealed in Holy Scripture, uh, is goes back to creation, right? So you have the creator who made himself known to Adam and Eve, and after the fall into sin, uh, 
God still was revealing to Adam and his descendants his will for mankind, and the basic understanding of right and wrong, law and gospel even, uh, would would have been there as God revealed it to Adam and his descendants. But because of sin, uh, the true religion was corrupted, and uh, descendants of Adam, um, from Cain and so forth, were uh, corrupted to true religion. They still retain a knowledge of, and, and would still have a conscience that would the tell The law them, has written in human hearts. The law is written so in human And so your conscience hearts. may accuse you, and if there's a disaster, like your crops fail or something, or a disease, you think, well, the gods must be against us because we've not done things right, so we've got to offer up a sacrifice to appease the gods. So there, there, the there's idea? a sense of guilt, right? So there's going to be a sense of guilt and man-made religions that are are a, a corruption and not the true religion as God revealed it to himself by himself through his word and through the holy prophets and apostles. You know, people would come up with their own ideas of many gods that control this or that, the weather, the crops, mm-hmm. fertility and things, and trying to appease their wrath by sacrifices of animals or something like this. But that's merely a corruption of the true religion as God revealed it. So already in Genesis, you saw uh, Cain and Abel uh, after the fall uh, still making sacrifices to God. And uh, and there too, as gets pointed out in the letter to the Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Whereas one uh, son's uh, sacrifice is pleasing to God and the other's is not. Well, the difference is faith, right? And and faith ultimately in the promise of God, the promise of the coming Savior, who would be the seed of the woman and ultimately uh, the son of Mary, son of God, our Savior. I, I see a couple of big differences here between the Christian, biblical, uh, Old Testament, New Testament idea of sacrifice and the pagan religion sacrifice. One, the biggest difference is uh, in one, God is providing the sacrifice. Uh, we can't do it. And um, uh, the other is, see, if you think there's some disaster, your kids or cattle or crops are failing, um, that the gods are not pleased with you and that you can pay them off or buy them off. But then what if your life is going hunky-dory? You think, well, the gods must be pleased with me, and you are proud, and you think they're, you don't need any atoning sacrifice when you do. Because you could be a proud sinner, a hypocrite, uh, and uh, you cannot you cannot make a sacrifice that atones for your own sins. No, and that that's why the that's, even the animal sacrifices offered by the faithful people of God in the Old Testament really could only point forward to the sacrifice, as you said, that God provided. Which is why the story of uh, Abraham is such a, a moving substitute. Story. Yes, the binding of Isaac, uh, Genesis twenty-two. So God, God Himself provide. provided the lamb, right? Absolutely, he, he provided the lamb so that uh, Isaac didn't die, and the son, the dearly loved, the beloved son. son. So God gives His only dearly beloved Son, who is the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin. And of because the world. Christ came in the flesh, fulfilled the law, uh, suffered unjustly in our place on the cross. Uh, He suffered the punishment of the law, and because he is the very son of God, his shed blood has infinite worth, pastor worth, uh, to atone for the sins of all mankind. Absolutely, and and that's why it's such a beautiful thing to see in the Revelation of John, for example, that the the redeemed in heaven, they're wearing white robes that have been made white in the blood of the Lamb. Their sins washed away. Yep. All right, let's read paragraph 24. Uh, Let this remain the case. Christ's death alone is truly an atoning sacrifice. For the Levitical atoning sacrifices, the ones uh, provided for in the book of Leviticus under the law of Moses, the Levitical atoning sacrifices were so-called only to illustrate a future remedy. As you say, they were a type fulfilled in a greater way by Christ. Because of a certain resemblance, they were satisfactions Uh, delivering the righteousness of the law and preventing those persons who sinned from being excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. But after the revelation of the gospel, these sacrifices had to end. Since they had to end in the revelation of the gospel, they were not true atoning sacrifices. For the gospel was promised specifically to present an atoning sacrifice. All right, so I think we've covered this big section on atoning sacrifice. Let's at least begin to get into this portion now on Eucharistic sacrifices. You said there were two kinds of sacrifice, atoning, 
which uh, 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 covers sin, merits, uh, uh, righteousness with God. And then there are Eucharistic sacrifices, which are a response to God's grace, which are sacrifices of thanksgiving. So paragraph 25. Now, the rest uh, of sacrifices, now the rest are Eucharistic sacrifices, which are called sacrifices of praise, uh, Leviticus, Psalms, etc. These are the preaching of the gospel, faith, prayer, thanksgiving, confession, the troubles of saints. That's interesting. He puts that in there. Yes, all good works of saints. These sacrifices are not satisfactions for those making them, nor can they be applied to others, like with the private masses, uh, to merit the forgiveness of sins or reconciliation by the outward act alone, ex opera operato. Uh, they are made by those who have been reconciled. Paragraph 26. These are the sacrifices of the New Testament, as Peter teaches, quote, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices, however, are contrasted not only with those of cattle, but even with human works offered by the outward act, because spiritual refers to the movements of the Holy Spirit in us. Paul teaches the same thing. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Spiritual worship means, however, a service in which God is known and is grasped by the mind. This happens in the movements of fear and trust toward God. Therefore, it contrasts not only with the Levitical service in which cattle are slain, but also with the service in which a work is imagined to be offered by the outward act. The epistle to the Hebrews teaches the same thing. Quote, Through him, Christ, uh, then let us offer, con- let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Hebrews 13, verse 15. He adds the interpretation that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. He asks us to offer praises, that is, prayer, thanksgiving, confession, and the like. These benefit not by the outward act, but because of faith. This is taught by the clause, through him, then, let us continually offer, that is, by faith in Christ. So, Pastor Worth, uh, do Christians offer sacrifices to God? Yes. And in this sense, as we're saying, sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise, and that involves, for example, in our worship service, when we pray to God, when we sing hymns to God, when we confess to one another the great things that God has done for us, this is our response to what God has given us in Christ Jesus. And and Thursday morning, Thanksgiving Day, is going to be a prime example of this where we're going to give thanks to God for what we call his first article gifts, second article gifts, third article gifts, his uh, blessings on our country and our daily life, as well as uh, Christ's atoning sacrifice and the preaching of the gospel by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And and so and this is meat right and salutary. It's again it, it's, it's, it's our duty to thank and praise him for is, all these. Yeah, that that is right. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to do this. There you go on to the other point that these are spiritual sacrifices. Explain that. Well the Holy Spirit through the gospel is at work in us, working repentance working faith, and bringing forth the fruit of faith. And the fruit of faith is that we love God and we love and serve our neighbor. And we want to give thanks and praise to God, worship God, adore him, as well as tell others the good news of who he is and what he's done for us. And all of that, that response to God's goodness to us is, uh, you know, his grace then we respond to it with, with thanks and praise and so forth. That with our, is our hands, with our hearts, with our lips, um, with our pocketbooks, these are all ways to give thanks and praise to God as a Eucharistic, but not atoning sacrifice. And, and not with the expectation that thereby we are earning God's favor, uh, working our way to heaven, uh, or trying to earn grace and favor for the dead or somebody mm-hmm. else. Uh, it, it's it, We understand this purely as our Holy Spirit-enabled response to God's goodness to us. We love because he first loved us. That's what this is all about. Explain the word Eucharist. We sometimes call the Lord's Supper the Eucharist. 
there's a proper way to think of that, isn't there? Certainly. You know, on, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, you know, he took bread and gave thanks, blessed it, and, and so forth, and, you know, said, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. And and when you consider the service of the Mass, uh, as we retain it, the divine service, the service of the sacrament, Notice how many times in the service of the sacrament we mm-hmm. talk about we give you thanks. Yes. We give you thanks both before the post communion collect. Right. Before and after the sacrament is celebrated, we're giving thanks to God for what he's done and imploring that we may receive his gifts rightly and uh by faith in Jesus and believing his promise, this is my body given for you, this is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, and that we then may love God and that we may love one another. So yeah. faith to, faith in God, love toward one another, our proper responses as God the Holy Spirit works through the means of grace. And in Holy Communion, we even call it the cup of thanksgiving or the cup of blessing for which we give thanks or for which we bless. So that's the origin of this term the Eucharist, Indeed. referring to the Lord's Supper. But that is, again, a response. It's not the biggest thing. The big thing is the arrow coming from God to us to give us the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, but it is only appropriate in that context to return thanks to God. Yes. Very good. All right, paragraph 27, and I think we'll try 28 as well. In short, the worship of the New Testament is spiritual. It is the righteousness of faith in the heart and the fruit of faith. New Testament worship sets aside Levitical services, meaning we don't offer up bloody bulls on the on the altar. Christ says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So it's got to be according to true teaching, and it's got to be uh, the Holy Spirit working in your spirit to in faith in Christ and its fruit. This passage, uh, that's from John 4, this passage clearly condemns opinions about sacrifices that, as the adversaries imagine, benefit by the outward act, ex opera operato. In contrast, it teaches that people should worship in spirit, that is, with the inclinations of the heart and by faith. So, even in the Old Testament, the prophets condemn the opinion of the people about the outward act, opus operatum, and teach the righteousness and sacrifices of the Spirit. And here Melanchthon will go into a a length of Old Testament citations to show how the prophets condemned a mere outward religion. Um, And he's got a quote here uh, from... uh, uh, saying, Jeremiah, I, yeah, from Jeremiah, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices, but this commandment I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God, and so on, Jeremiah 7. Um, I know in reading Jeremiah, I mean, he they thought, because they're in Jerusalem, they'll say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, that they would be spared the Babylonian captivity, but they were not, and Jeremiah condemned their just mechanical outward religion was not connected to faith and repentance. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, indeed, uh, all the all the prophets uh, have such statements too. Isaiah as well. And the Psalms. And, and the Psalms uh, condemn people who thought that by the mere outward motions of making sacrifice to God that they would somehow please him even though their hearts were far away. They were impenitent and unbelieving. They were disobedient and wicked and yet they thought by going through the motions and going to the temple that would be good enough. Do you think there could be a parallel in a way in our day with church members perhaps? It it certainly is possible if I think that by going to church and just showing up. Or being a member, having your name on a membership roster. That that, that's, that's good enough and that if 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 I don't repent of my sins, I don't believe in Jesus, and it's all for show. Uh, and hey, our family's been members of the Missouri Senate since 1840. Yeah, so something like that would certainly not be God pleasing. You know, God doesn't need your church membership. Just like God said, I don't need your sacrifices. You know, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. So mm-hmm. if I were hungry, would I tell you? So it's it's not about God needing anything. It's not what God's needs. It's what we need, and He's the one who provides, and the only one who can provide what we need, and that's what he provides in Christ Jesus and his once and for all sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And the intent, of course, is that we should receive
receive the benefit of his life, suffering, death, and resurrection through the gospel as the Holy Spirit uses the means of grace to bring us to repentance, to bring us to faith, so that by faith, that is trusting God's promised mercy in Christ, we receive the forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, and every good gift. That's the intention. And if, if our faith is not there, if we do yeah. not believe it, uh, then if we're only being hypocritical or doing it for show or self-righteously thinking we're earning God's favor, then that is an abomination. Yeah. Our faith is in Christ, our Savior, in in, in the objective means of grace that God you know, I'm baptized. You're trusting in God's promise then. I am. I just received Holy Communion. I have the forgiveness of sins. You're trusting in what God is giving you, not in just a mere uh, outward association with a Christian church body. And we're clear that we're, we're not the ones doing God a favor. So baptism is not me doing something for yeah. God. It's the arrow's got to come from God to God us. God is baptizing me. God is washing me. God is providing something to me in baptism. And likewise in the Lord's Supper, I'm not giving him something. He's giving me something mm-hmm. by giving me the body and blood of Jesus and thereby the forgiveness of my sins. Let me continue in paragraph 28 here. How do we suppose that the Jews received this charge, which is uh, from Jeremiah, which seems to conflict openly with Moses, where Jeremiah is saying, I don't want your sacrifices. Well, God had said through Moses, I want you, I want you to offer sacrifices. Well, he'll go on here. God clearly gave the fathers, the Jewish fathers, the Israelites, commands about burnt offerings and victims. But Jeremiah condemns the opinion about sacrifices that God had not delivered, namely that these services please him by the outward act. Concerning faith, he adds that God had commanded this, hear me, that is, believe me that I am your God and that I wish to be known when I care for you and help you. I do not need your sacrificial victims. Believe that I want to be God, the justifier and savior, not because of works, but because of my word and promise. Truly seek and expect help from me from the heart. Paragraph 29. uh, This is all along in the same lines here. Uh, uh, Psalm 50, verses 13 through 15, which rejects sacrificial victims and requires prayer, also condemns the opinion about the outward act, opus operatum. Do I eat the flesh of bulls? Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. The psalmist testifies that this is true service and true honor if we call upon him from the heart. Likewise, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but you have given me an open ear. Psalm 40, verse 6. That is, you have offered me your word that I may hear it, and you you do require that I believe your word and your promises. You truly desire to care for me and to help, and so on. Likewise, you will not be pleased with a burnt offering, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Psalm 4, verse 5. He asks us to hope and says that this is a righteous sacrifice, meaning that other sacrifices are not true and righteous sacrifices. And, quote, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Psalm 116, verse 17. Warren, I remember when I was at uh, seminary, uh, Dr. Hummel, when he would, Old Testament professor, great professor, uh, would talk about these verses where, where God says, uh, I do not want your sacrifices. He called that dialectical negation, meaning he does want your sacrifices, but he doesn't want them in such a way that they're disconnected from faith. That's so, the point. Yeah. That's so, the point. But the Old Testament has this way of saying, I don't want it, when it's just saying, you know, smooth that way, I don't want it apart from faith. And ultimately, it comes back to what God really wants is to save you. And to do that, he provided the sacrifice. And that sacrifice is his own son, Jesus, who is true God and true man, who went to Calvary's cross as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice to take away all sins forever. And that's what God was always wanting, is the Old Testament people of God, the New Testament people of God, to believe that promise, to trust in Jesus as that sacrifice, and to respond to God's goodness by repenting, by believing in Jesus, and receiving what only God can give, forgiveness of sins, 
life, and salvation. Just one more quick paragraph, 30. Scripture is full of such references that teach that sacrifices by the outward act, ex opera operato, do not reconcile God. Since Levitical services have been repealed, the New Testament teaches that new and pure sacrifices will be made. Faith, prayer, thanksgiving, confession, the preaching of the gospel, troubles on account of the gospel, and the like. So to sum this all up, there is only one atoning sacrifice, and Christ Jesus, the Son of God, made that for your sins on the cross. In response to that, moved by the Holy Spirit, we Christians now do offer up uh, Eucharistic sacrifices of praise and good works, and that is accepted to Christ on behalf, uh, accepted to God on a on account of Christ's righteousness. And so that's what we'll be doing Thursday morning in our Thanksgiving services will be Eucharistic service, uh, sacrifices and thanking God for what he has blessed us with. You've been listening to Concord Matters here on KFUO.